cover those around the world who are making true global impact, and so often or not, it could very well be your neighbor. So tonight's show, Gail, it's, is it education? Is it business? Is it both? Actually, I think that's what it is. It's both. It is. It's interesting. Our, um, Michael Finney is a professor at the Thunderbird School. Interestingly, he's talking about philanthrocapitalism. And this is a new word that's starting to gain some awareness. It's not something that we necessarily look at as our gross domestic product, it, but mm -hmm. we do export it because we have thousands upon thousands of nonprofit organizations that do global work, not only in our state of Washington where we are here, but around the United States. And yeah, my own background is in corporate social responsibility, working with, with businesses and helping them not only do the right thing, but also to do it in such a way that it, it's serving their bottom line too. It's actually, it's called the triple bottom line. And something that I was so impressed with what uh, Professor Finney said is that more and more students who are looking to become masters of business are wanting to make sure that they work for a company that is socially responsible. You know, you're absolutely right, Stan. It's not just about working for a company that's socially responsible. They want to have impact. So we're seeing corporations who allow their employees to spend time doing good work outside of their everyday work day and still getting paid for it. Yeah, yeah an interesting thing about Professor Finney is, is has he really talked about it? He, he said that what he's hearing are great ideas from students who want to go and take those great ideas and then incorporate them into the companies that they work for. So it may just be that these students are taking their new ideas to companies that are having, helping them to grow uh, in their social responsibility and at the same point in time they're building, helping build a good name for their company. It not only builds a good name for the company, it makes good economic sense. And, and how so? And that is something that I think, uh, and I've, I've dealt with, with CEOs of, of companies before, several of them, who don't necessarily make that connection. How come they don't? Well, it decreases their turnover rate. They keep the really good people. It provides them a, a great market or brand name. When people know that they're doing good work, they'd rather mm -hmm. buy from them. Yep. So it is the triple bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, as a consumer, if, if I've got a choice between two products and they're roughly the same price, uh, because we're all price sensitive, but they're roughly the same price, I'm going to go for the one that I know that the company is more responsible. And whether that is a cola product or whether it is a candy bar. Absolutely, Stan. And I think that uh, Michael Finney is going to tell us more about that. All right. Well, let's go to Professor Finney from the Thunderbird School of Management. Yes, we have. We've, um, we're involved in several different projects with several different partnerships here. Primarily, the, the ones I'm directly representing have, are related to the uh, Inter-American Development Bank as well as ExxonMobil and Ashoka. Um, we're working with ExxonMobil on three different innovator projects in uh, Africa, two in Uganda, and one in Ghana. All of them have to do with technology and women, and because that's essentially what the ExxonMobil Foundation's mission is directly related with. And we are helping these small innovators develop um, their technologies for alternative energy sources, whether that be solar lanterns or developing moringa for bio di biofuel development. Um, and my teams are directly supporting the, the um, strategic initiatives of each one of these innovators, and we are providing them with a host of management services that are helping them polish their business plans, helping them understand how they can manage supply chains even in these very, very remote locations. We're helping them understand how they can scale their um, organizations and how they can take them into surrounding countries. That was one thing that ExxonMobil was particularly interested in was using the Thunderbird Emerging Market Laboratory program to help them scale and assure the sustainability of the innovators that we're working with. Um, interestingly, when uh, people talk about social welfare and benefits, oftentimes business is left out of the picture, but you're from a school of management. Yes, we are. We're very strongly supporting what's essentially turned into a bit of a movement that's a value based around social enterprise. And 
and really quite frankly the bottom line of social enterprise is you're creating social benefit as you're creating profit and that's a movement that's come about largely because of uh, an increase in the interest of the millennial students who have a huge value around giving back and creating value socially right now so we have students who are coming into our programs that that's the way they want to express themselves professionally and at the same time more and more organizations are understanding that creating social benefit actually allows them competitive advantage particularly in these emerging markets. Tell us about some of those students who you're, you're talking about. Well, the Thunderbird School for Global Business is an international MBA program, um, and we have a good 50% of our students are international, uh, and one of my, I teach leadership on campus, and in one of my leadership classes I can have literally 15 different nationalities, and that creates an amazing prism through which these ideas and concepts are filtered and the conversations around these issues are quite literally fascinating because I've got that type of diversity and that type of variety in the classroom. One of the innovators uh, coming out of the Emerging Lab is, uh, or Emerging Technologies Lab, is the Productive Agricultural Linkages and uh, Marketing System, Palms. Palms, that's a group that we're very, very pleased to be working with. Um, they are serving a huge number of people at the moment. They're probably already serving about 100,000 people by the time we're through with them and helping them scale up their program. We're hoping that they're going to be reaching about 250 to 300,000 people with their programs. They're very concerned with growing moringa. And moringa is a plant that grows under extreme conditions in Africa and it's incredibly nutritious so it has a high food value and at the same time the plant also is used to create biofuel and so it's a double whammy if you want of creating of really helping them develop processes for increasing the crop yield on moringa so that they can feed children with it the, the nutrients in moringa are just unbelievably beneficial especially for children and so we're helping them, you know, increase crop yield and increase the yield so that they can feed more children and increase the available biofuel in the region. So here at CGI, you had some people from Namibia and from Ghana who were here. Were, are any of them involved with Palms? No, those are with different groups, Solar Sister, and then we've got another group, Small Solutions, that we're working with. All right, let's talk about Solar Sister. Solar Sister is a, another one of these quite wonderful programs that is essentially adopted an Avon selling strategy to use women to sell solar lights to women in rural areas of Africa that is not electrified. And this is, of course, if you've been paying attention to what's going on here at the initiative, the whole issue of electrification of rural areas is, is a huge issue and because electrification is in some instances still maybe a decade away from some of the more rural regions in Africa, solar power is really the only alternative and these solar lights that the solar sisters are selling uh, literally allow the, the women's families to extend their work hours. Students have these lights now that they can study with at night. Um, the lights they can carry with them when they're you know, running errands at night so that it increases their visibility and increases their security and they're not at such health risk for a, for a variety of reasons. Are they, are they handheld? Handheld. Very handheld. There's two different sizes. There's one that is about the size of my palm and there's one that's a little bit larger. They are ingeniously designed. They've got a clip at one end so they can clip on a belt, they can clip on a garment in order to you know, improve their portability. And you, you also mentioned that these were safer, safer than well, the, the lights are much, much safer than using kerosene for lighting at night and for the health factors. Uh, it, it's just, again, an unbelievable advancement. Breathing kerosene smoke and the potential for fire if, if a kerosene lantern gets knocked over is, is fairly large. And so this increases the, the safety issues inside the home and keeps people from having to breathe, really, quite frankly, toxic fumes. Are there other innovations that are coming out of the emerging 
uh, Technologies Lab, mm -hmm. Merging Markets Lab. The Merging Markets Laboratory. We're working in so many different countries right now on so many different issues. In Guatemala, we're working for the Guatemalan government and helping them develop a whole new cadre of export-oriented small to medium-sized businesses. And we're helping those small to medium-sized businesses actually improve their market position internationally and throughout the Americas. From a technology perspective, we've been um, also working with some groups in uh, Kenya with the Grameen Foundation, with microfinance, and strictly from a technology perspective and helping the Grameen Foundation roll out a new uh, microfinance uh, software tool for banks to use. Um, there's quite a few things like that that we're working with at the moment. Professor, what you've talked about is hardcore capitalism. And? Is that a good thing? Um, Mohammed Yunus has a different version, a different perspective on this than I do. He's, he's got a very rigorous definition of what a social business is about, and he believes that a social business should, any profit that it creates should be plowed back into the services that that business is providing. And we work with uh, a large number of social businesses that have been funded by venture capitalists and some of that capital that they're investing is patient capital. In other words, they're not looking for an immediate return. They're not looking for a quarterly return like what much of capitalism is about. They're looking for a longer term return on their investment and they're lending that capital specifically in a way that is going to assure social benefit. So if you want to consider it an evolution of capitalism that has a social conscience, yes, it's capitalism with a social conscience. Um, are people in the developing world uh, good capitalists? Are they good business people? Excellent. Some of the best. Um, we've worked in Vietnam, and Vietnam is an entire country of entrepreneurs. And the uh, minute that they get the minimal amount of education or skill building necessary in order to thrive, they, they go straight to work in developing their own company and their own organization. They're one of the most admirable entrepreneurial cultures in the world right now. I can say the same thing about Peru. We're doing a lot of work in the Thunderbird Emerging Market Laboratories in Peru. And it's the exact same thing. You give them just enough information in order to assure their personal competencies. They're going to open a business so that they can take care of their families. Um, it's, they, there's this misconception that people in emerging markets need to be taken care of. And it's uh, an inaccurate perception. They're quite capable of taking care of themselves as long as they get the minimal amount of skill building they need and the minimal amount of capital to put them in charge of their own lives. I'm hearing that you're bullish on global development. Absolutely. I'm bullish on global development in emerging markets. Emerging markets is the future of uh, the um, developed world, quite frankly. I think the statistics look like something right now, like 80% um, of the world is the emerging markets. And that 80% right now is consuming 50% of the, of the developed world's products. And that's now before they've even started producing their own products. And you see more and more often that the most innovative, disruptive innovations are being developed in emerging markets and are now being distributed in developed markets. So that's what we call reverse innovation where innovations are taking place in emerging markets and then being distributed globally into developed markets. It's, it's an amazingly exciting time to be involved in emerging markets at the moment. I want to go over the partnership, uh, the one specifically here for CGI, yes. the ExxonMobil and Ashoka. What's, uh, what's Ashoka's role in this? Ashoka essentially is, we, we work through the change makers program that they have and they have a network that's uh, international and they have a very good strategy for supporting and encouraging competitions for ideas. And ExxonMobil had a mission. And that mission was we need to do something 
really important that is going that is going to involve technology and women that will remove women from poverty and empower their lives. So there we have the interview with, with Professor Finney. It didn't seem like hardcore business until you really, really listen. And then what he's talking about is true business, corporate social responsibility, students who are masters of business who want to do something great for the world. You know, we're starting to see more and more examples of good corporate social responsibility. We're seeing actual classrooms dedicated to training about corporate social responsibility. Of course, you've, you've taught that class yourself. But there are a number of um, corporations that we've interviewed just recently mm -hmm. that we've seen remarkable efforts on behalf of um, the disadvantaged, uh, disease, uh, disaster. Well, Starbucks um, is, is a great example of a company that has actually incredibly improved the lives of farmers uh, that they deal with because they've increased their uh, the prices that they pay, but also then they've gone into the communities and they've helped create clinics health clinics that they absolutely needed. Well, that ends up, you bring up a really good point, Stan, and that is the fact that there is um, oftentimes with corporate social responsibility, they want to work on their own business, but they want to add to something in addition to that. Mm -hmm. So bringing the clinics in, it's bringing a health piece in, some bring education in. It's nice to see that collaborative effort. Well, Microsoft is another really good example of what they do. They help train people uh, and particularly young women in, uh, in countries that are low-income countries. And then all of a sudden, these women become economic powers in and of themselves. It is changing, life-changing, community-changing, whole everything changing as a result of some of the work that Microsoft is doing. And so while you think, wow, this is this giant software entity, they're actually doing some really good things right at the base level. They are, and they even bring in things like, it may be computer training, uh, but it also business law. They, they train some of these girls with some amazing skill sets so when they graduate from high school they can actually get a job. There's other companies that, I mean we, we did some interviews like with UPS and ExxonMobil and Nike but there's other companies like Cummins Diesel. They have a fantastic corporate social responsibility uh, plan all over the world. REI is another company that, that comes to my mind. They do some fantastic things and it's so much of it is, is comes from the top and at REI the top is heavily involved and it comes all the way down to every single employee at that company it seems. You know I agree I think uh, and we've got someone coming up here now Taryn Bird who's mm -hmm. also got another piece of business. Yeah from the Business Civic Leadership Center which is the nonprofit arm of the US Chamber of Commerce very very smart people because they help businesses come together to work here in the United States to work in other parts of the world and basically to to help companies have an impact where they want to have an impact than socially responsible. Taryn Bird's up next. So one of the, uh, the the platforms of the Business Civic Leadership Center is best practice sharing and it's really important both for companies who are working in the sector and NGO partners in the public sector to understand what has worked and what hasn't worked so that we're not making the same mistakes. And one of the partnerships that we highlighted this year was through um, a series that we're doing called the Global Corporate Citizenship Issue Series where we look at how companies are contributing in partnership to the water sector, the food security, economic development, and then also health. And through our food security forum, we had the chance to sit down with Cargill and Care and really examine how their food security initiatives are changing the lives of individuals um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and how they're empowering local farmers to improve their crop yield, to increase their entrepreneurship values, and also from a microenterprise level, providing them with the capital that they need to invest in both product, um, know-how and knowledge and provide that education so that they're able to further their specific uh, their specific initiatives. And this is at the base level in sub-Saharan Africa? This is not something coming out of Washington DC for example? No, you're looking at um, care field workers, you're looking at also, but what I talked about earlier, that technical expertise, the Cargill employees, how they're able to play into this and provide what they do as a business to help further the social programs and the programming of care um, and they do this in partnership. It's a really great partnership and very integrated where they're both able to come to the table with a core skill that's both furthering their work in the food security area. Well, tell us about a specific partnership related to healthcare. 
So among the companies that BCLC works with, we work uh, with, with companies that are very engaged in healthcare initiatives, whether that be through GlaxoSmithKline or Abbott um, Laboratories. But one company that's really ramped up their work in the healthcare sector, specifically in, uh, in Angola, is Chevron. Chevron, the oil company, is in the healthcare yes. sector? And uh, they have invested much of their funds and also partnered with the, uh, co the Business Coalition Against HIV, AIDS, and Malaria on educating their employees about the ramifications of the disease, of being infected with the disease in treatment, and the importance of keeping your family educated uh, about, uh, about what that means and what your, what your realistic um, life can be after, afterwards, after, after finding out that you have the disease. And so, um, you know, it's an area where you wouldn't think that they would be engaged. It's not in their core competency. It's not, you know, traditionally where you would think an oil company would engage in this kind of work. And um, they've done so pretty extensively. So is it working? I would say, you know, I think you'd have to ask them. Um, my perspective, yes. Um, they've started with a more small skill set in terms of their employees, their direct employees, and, and hopefully that will grow from there. Okay, a little bit about the business core concept. How does that work? So business core, uh, what BCLC, as I explained earlier, uh, we, we've developed a, a platform to engage more companies in international volunteering. And it's in pilot stage right now, where we're looking at how companies can stay engaged longer term in Haiti. As many of us saw, um, the corporate contributions to the response in Haiti was about $148 million just for the emergency response. And many companies are investing much more capital, technical expertise, and know-how following the January 12th uh, earthquake. And so what we're doing as an organization is to be able to provide them with the platform to engage. And we have different skill sets from engineering companies, from retail firms, from from pharmaceutical companies that are able to come to the table and provide a skill set that's needed by NGOs that are working in country. And so what we've done is we're providing a platform for them to engage um, either on a micro level or a macro level how much they would like to, to get their employees engaged um, in country with an NGO that has a need. Well, what are the, some of the things that they're doing and, and who's doing it? So one of the first projects that, that we've been working on is with an NGO called CHF International. What do they do? They've recently, they, they're traditionally an NGO that works in, um, that's worked in Haiti for about 20 years and have focused on shelter. That's really their core competency as an NGO. What they've done is they've been also able to expand their services and what they're working on and have expanded it into the retail sector. And they've reopened what's called the Haiti Apparel Center where individuals are able to come and to learn how to actually use some of the machinery that's used in a retail factory so that they can come to the Haiti Apparel Center, learn how to use the showing machine, and leave and be able to get placed in a job. And actually job placement, leaving the Haiti Apparel Center, is about 95%. So it's pretty high that when an individual goes through this program, they're then directly uh, employed in a, local, uh, in a local facility. And so with the reopening and kind of the, 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 the rebranding of this center, um, there's also a lot of skills that are needed and lacking. And, and what we've been able to do is identify those needs, such as a financial reporting, such as documentation, such as providing health care to the individuals that are going through the program. And right now we're in the process of, uh, of finding where that corporate skill set can come in and fill those needs. Well, this leads perfectly into the mapping project that the Global Citizenship Program is undertaking. Tell us about that. As an organization, uh, one of the, the key components of what we provide both to our corporate members but also to communities who are interested in learning more about what the private sector is doing in international development is providing them with an update and reports on where these programs are, how they're going about them, who their partners are. But in the past, it hasn't all been able to be viewed on one screen. So you're having to go to all of these different stories and read them and, and take some pretty substantial amount of time to really understand where these programs are. And so what we've been doing through the Global Corporate Citizenship Program is uh, looking at how we can put all of this on one screen so that you're able to go to a map and you're able to click on Brazil and see which companies are working in food security initiatives, which companies are working in education and how they're doing it so that we're able to take these best practices or even failures and learn from them as an organization 
as a community so that we're not repeating the same mistakes and we're able to take the best practices. And if a food security initiative worked in a certain part of the country with a tech firm, maybe some of those best practices and those skill sets would be applicable to a food security initiative anywhere else in the world. So as we sit here in New York in September of 2010, not too far from the UN, can you say that the mapping project is underway yet? Can I access it? You cannot access it yet. Um, we are looking for a rollout actually in, uh, uh, with a pilot in January uh, to be able to have a functional map that you'd be able to, um, to access and then to build from there. Companies, NGOs, and communities can all contribute to this? Right now we're looking at just mapping the private sector, but the interesting part about that is you can't map the private sector without mapping the NGO community or the public sector because they're their partners. And so uh, what, will be, what will be available and what we're hoping to debut early next year is a pilot program where individuals will be able to come to the map, click on a certain country, and learn about how these partnership programs are really working. Well, Taryn, thank you very much. We're looking forward to the next great stuff out of the Global Citizenship Program at the Business Civic Leadership Center. Thank you very much. So no matter where you go around the world, there are businesses who are actually helping at, at the, the base level, socially responsible businesses, and the Business Civic Leadership Center, part of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, helps make it happen. You know, and they also do some global work as part of the International Chamber of Commerce as well. Mm-hmm. So they actually have a fairly large following. So this gives young people an opportunity. If they're looking for a job at a, at a company, now you've got a choice. And the choice is, do I go work for a company just for, for this pay or this opportunity, or do I go to work for this company for this pay, this opportunity, and the fact that I can feel good about the, the company that I'm working for? you got that choice today. Well, and more and more businesses, again, it goes back to the importance of collaboration and the importance of their bottom line. It's an important marketing tool for them because people who invest and buy things from these companies want to know they're doing good. Yeah, so rainmakers are at all level uh, levels. Rainmakers are the, the woman who carries the water. Rainmakers is the, the NGO who, who helps her so that she doesn't have to carry the water. And then the rainmaker is the entity that helps make it happen by a contribution. So with that, if you want to learn more about all the great organizations who we interview, go to www.rainmakers.tv, and we'll see you next week right here, Rainmakers TV. Take care.